Good evening. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lehman. I'm from Moulton in North Alabama. And I'm excited to be able to speak to you tonight. Uh, thankful for the invitation I received from uh, Jamie Gilliam. I uh, hadn't seen Jamie in a while. Uh, we used, we go all the way back to uh, our high school days. He was in uh, Decatur, and I was just a few miles away in Moulton. Uh, our congregations used to do a lot together. I went to Camp Maywood together. Uh, I used to think Jamie was so awesome because he was in a uh, Christian acapella quartet, and they used to sing at different youth rallies and different events. And uh, I used to think that was so cool. Uh, hadn't got to see Jamie in a while, but get to keep up with some of the things that are going on in his life in uh, through Facebook. And uh, I hope that he is doing well. And I know that y'all have a blessing in having him there at your congregation. Um, like I said, again, my name is Jonathan Lehman. Uh, I am 40 years old. I am uh, work for the Lawrence County, Alabama school system, along with my wife that does as well. We have two kids. Uh, we've been married 17 years. Uh, my son is in seventh grade, uh, and my daughter is in third grade. Uh, my son was baptized uh, last year, became a Christian last year, so very proud of him. Uh, for the last uh, seven years, I've been the pulpit preacher for the Loser Church of Christ here in Lawrence County. That's L-O-O-S-I-E-R, not L-O-S-E-R. <laughs> it's the loser congregation I started out there helping out that uh, smaller congregation as a fill-in for them and seven years later I was still there uh, I've also uh, been in youth ministry uh, closer to my college years and in college um, my wife and I are now uh, looking for a congregation for our family uh, to to uh, just be involved in and to let our children have some more kids around their age. And so uh, we have a lot of good congregations in this area and just haven't nailed one down yet as to where we want to um, be permanently, but hopefully uh, we will soon. But again, I'm just thankful to have this opportunity to speak to you tonight, and I hope that it is a lesson that is beneficial for you. Hope that it is something that, that blesses you. I went back and listened to a lot of your Wednesday night series that you've had already and you had some great speakers and they seem to have covered the topic very, very well. And it's interesting when I ask Jamie about how this was going to work, I said, you know, are you giving different speakers different aspects of this? text to talk about or how, how do you want to do this and he said no I've just given all the speakers this one text and he said believe it or not by the power of God none of them have overlapped and nobody kind of had the same perspective or the same lesson and uh, that is so interesting how God can make that work and I believe that's why he wanted people to be around each other because everybody has different viewpoints and different opinions and, and different ways of looking at scripture. And so tonight, I'm hoping to not uh, give you a lesson that you've heard before or one that, that has already been covered by your speakers. And, and so we'll just jump right in. As we think about uh, this text from John chapter 8, uh, it, it's finds itself in an interesting place. It is recorded right after uh, the woman is caught in adultery and brought to Christ. And then it is right before he addresses again the Pharisees about his credibility and about um, who he says that he is. Um, and it's interesting that some versions uh, put the, the heading uh, on this scripture on each side of John 8 and verse 12. Some uh, combine it into the story of the woman caught in adultery. Some combine it into Jesus 
beginning a second narration or a second dialogue with the Pharisees uh, about who he is. Um, however you look at it, uh, it, it doesn't matter. It does seem to fit well with, with his credibility as he makes a proclamation that he is the light of the world. Uh, and the Pharisees question how he has the authority to, to make such a proclamation. But as we think about this concept of light, we know that it's all throughout John. We know that John covers this in, in a variety of ways and how he is discussing light and how that God is light and that Christ, uh, God in man's form, is light and that he is to reflect the light of God. Um, I want us to kind of look at it a little bit differently tonight because you can take all the passages of light throughout scripture um, and look at them. Um, I have my PowerPoint right here below my camera, so maybe that won't be too distracting if I look down. Uh, but if you look at the concept of light in scripture, you can see that this light that Jesus mentions in John uh, chapter 8 is one you know that this light is God. Let's think about that. The, the light mentioned here as well as in other places of scripture, light in scripture is represented as God. Um, 1 John 1 and verse 5 says, this is the message we heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in, in him is no darkness. Uh, you also can tell throughout Scripture that this light is Christ. Um, that we we can tell that from even uh, the Gospel of John that we've been looking at, um, that y'all have been looking at, but that John uh, chapter twelve verse thirty five says. So Jesus said to them, "The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you." The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. So, we also know that the light referenced, especially in the Gospel of John, is Christ himself. But we also see that this light that's mentioned in Scripture is not only God, is not only Christ, but this light is salvation. Because 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, as it is written, that says you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. If we are this chosen race, this royal priesthood, a holy nation, then obviously we have become a saved people stepping into the light of God, taking part in the light of God. And so we know that it is salvation as well. Um, also, Psalms 27 and verse 1, David writes, the, light, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So we know that the light is also uh, a, a way of describing salvation that if you are in the light, that you are in that saved condition. We also see the light as, as being brought about um, or being discussed as an aspect of forgiveness and an aspect of understanding. Um, we take 1 John 1 and verse 7, we talk about that often in invitations, saying that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So, this light that we have the ability to walk in, which is of God and being saved, but also offers a continual cleansing, a continual forgiveness um, to God if we're willing to repent of the things that, uh, that we do when we mess up. And so uh, we see the light there as, as corresponding with forgiveness. We also see light in the Bible corresponding and talking about guidance, John 12 and, and verse 35, as we mentioned earlier, as Jesus describes himself as the light and says, I won't be with you any longer. Take advantage of the fact that I'm here with you as light because here's the conditions or here's the, um, the aspects of 
light and darkness. It says that if you have the light, um, darkness, um, you overcome the darkness. And if you have light, you can know where you're going. And and so we see light as guidance. We also see it uh, as as it was described for us that um, the word is a light unto our path. And so the word also being that light and that guidance that we can have. So we know all these aspects of light. We know that Jesus described himself as the light. God is described as light. And that I know that in some of your other lessons, it was discussed how that we are commanded to be the light. Matthew chapter 5 tells us that we are to be the light of the world and that we are to be one that shines out the glorification of God through the way that we live and through um, our interactions with others. And so God being the light, Christ being the light, and ourselves also to be that light and to, to reflect God through the way that we live and, and shine uh, as lights because Christ no longer being here on this earth, he he mentioned, like we said in John chapter 12, that his his light that he was radiating was temporary because he was only going to be on this earth for a short time. And so now the responsibility of this light falls on us. And so this light is a wonderful thing. We want it. We need it. Um, just like we think of physical light, um, not many people can say that they desire to be in darkness. Um, you know, most people don't like the dark very much. They're afraid of the dark. Um, they know that the dark offers danger. The dark offers um, things that are unsafe. And, and you know, we don't like the dark in most scenarios. We want light. And, and this light that's talked to us in talked about in scripture is something that we also need to desire. We need to desire this light. We need to desire to be in it. We need to desire to radiate it through our lives. And that is a decision that must be made by each Christian. And this is kind of where I want to allow our lesson to take a little bit of a turn and, and maybe discuss it in a way that hasn't been discussed uh, so far during your summer series. You know, in the mornings when I wake up my children and, and we go down the hall and we stop at each of their rooms, the first thing we're going to do is, is reach in their rooms and flip on the light. And the first thing they do is cover their eyes and and, and cover up with a blanket and, and kind of groan a little bit because they don't want the light. They were very comfortable in that darkness. They were asleep. They were resting. They didn't have to do anything. They were comfortable in that darkness. And when I bring light into the scenario and I try to wake them up with this light, they are unhappy. <laughs> they don't like it. And and uh, very many mornings we hear, turn off the light. And that's kind of a position and, and a thought that I want us to think about tonight. There are some people in the world who are very comfortable in darkness, in spiritual darkness. They find themselves in a place where they don't have to do anything. They have no moral responsibility. They they find themselves in a place where they're okay with the dark. And staying in that dark means that they don't really have to face the reality of what they're doing. We know that throughout scripture and, and some of the other speakers spoke to you about how light exposes what's in the dark. And so those that are in the dark, they know if there is no light present, then then it's not going to expose what they're doing and they don't have to deal with that or or accept that they are in darkness. And so the concept I want us to think about tonight is do you want the light? Do you want it in your life? Do you want to reflect it? Now on the surface that question would be easy if I if I said who in here wants to be uh, Christ-like? Who in here wants to show the glory of God? Who in here 
wants to be a good example, then then most everyone would raise their hand and say, I, I want that in my life. But the reality is, if we truly want something, then we have to do things about it. And we have to work towards those things. And we have to take part in the things needed to, to exemplify that and to, to truly say, not only do I want it, but I will work for it. So I want us to think about the condition somebody can be in that doesn't want light. The condition someone can be in tonight, someone in, in the audience tonight could be in this condition in which they could say, I'm not in the light. And, and I really, even though intellectually I know I need to be in it, I don't really want to make the effort. Or I don't want to to strive to resist the things of the world and and I just kind of want to live. It's a scary place to be. And, and some of the conditions that that happen because of this or or that cause this is you could think of it in, as a hardening of the heart. One who doesn't want to accept the light of God into their heart, one that doesn't want to have the light of Christ uh, shining through them could very well have a hardened heart. Now, this is even thought about as you look back at John chapter 1 as it's discussed that, that John is going to be the precursor to Christ. And, it, and it's discussed there. Look at John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was made... Uh, he was in the beginning with God, all things that were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This light came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness to the light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Listen to this. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. You think about that, and, and that narration goes throughout the New Testament as, as we see, especially in the Pharisees and in the Jews, that they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for this light to come, but they never expected it to come through this regular man, um, th this, this regular carpenter, this man who didn't demand respect or or command respect through his uh, the way he lived, or the way he looked, or the way he talked. He was no military leader. He was no king. And so they had a hard time hearing, especially like in our passage in John chapter 8, when he proclaims, I am the light of the world. He who walks in me does not walk in darkness, but has the light of life. And the Pharisees question that by saying, how dare you say that that's you? How dare you make a proclamation that you are the light of life? And so they had a hard time accepting it. And I believe in a lot of ways it was because of this hardened heart condition that kept them from seeing who Jesus really was. And so tonight, I kind of want to lean towards the question of, do you have a hardened heart that's keeping you from seeing the light? This concept of hardened heart is all throughout Scripture. You look at Ephesians 4 and verse 18, Paul writes, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Matthew 13, verse 14 and 15 quotes a, a prophecy of Isaiah that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For the people's heart has grown 
dull. And with their eyes, they can barely hear. And their eyes, they have closed, lest they should with their ear, eyes, sorry, with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn. And I would heal them. They've grown dull. Their heart had grown dull. This hardened heart is a condition in which we find ourselves not desiring to walk in the light as we should. Our heart becomes hard and calloused. You know, uh, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 2 talks about consciences or your conscience being seared. And what it meant by that is it was seared in a way that it no longer can be penetrated, no longer can be influenced by this light that's been offered to us. An impenetrable heart, like I said, can't be pierced. We look at, we think about Hebrews 4 and verse 12 that describes the word of God as this sharp sword. Well, a hardened heart can't even be penetrated by that word of God when that person's not allowing it to have any effect on them or to, to, to prick them in any way. So tonight, I want to ask, are you in that hardened condition? Do you find yourself in that seared conscience category? Do you find yourself in that dull heart? Are you allowing your eyes to see what God is doing? Are you allowing your ears to hear what the word of God is proclaiming to you, are you desiring to be in the light? I hope so, and 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 we need to discuss how we can get back to that point if we're not there today, but let's let's discuss that. How do we know if we've gotten to that point that we're not walking in the light anymore? You know, I always Think about that when I read the passage from 1 John that says if we walk in the light as he is in the light. You know, if you were to walk under someone holding a flashlight, um, you know, uh, someone else is holding the light and you are to walk in the light that they are providing for you, you have the ability to veer away from their light and eventually you'll find yourself in darkness. If you don't choose to stay in that light that's provided for you, then you can easily lose your way. And so God is projecting this light. God is providing this light. God is this light. Are you still walking under the umbrella of his light? Well, there's some ways to think about it if you're not. I want to ask you tonight, you know, do you still have any type of emotional response? And I, I don't mean necessarily going forward to the front row and asking for prayers, but, but an emotional response that evokes emotion in your life. It either causes happiness, it can cause sadness, it can cause disappointment, it can cause anger, it can cause um, um, a, a desire to change. It, it can cause a, a great deal of emotion. Uh, and having this emotional response involves a great deal of emotion. And so, do you still have any type of emotional response that's a positive way, in a positive way, when you worship? When you go to worship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, um, do you leave that worship setting having given your sacrifice of praise to God and know that you've done that or you simply sometimes find yourself going through the motions, just simply attending rather than participating. What about through the acts of worship when you sing? You know, singing is one of those things that God gave us that would spark emotion in our lives. It could cause us joy. It could cause us to think. Um, and, and the music that we sing and the song that songs that we sing, the hymns, uh, are designed to have 
cause us to have some type of emotional response. If we're not having that, then why, why sing? Um, also, when you hear prayer, are you praying along with those leading? Are you praying yourself in private? Are you still finding yourself desiring to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God? How about the words of Scripture? I grew up in the church. My dad was a preacher for over 40 years. I um, had elders and deacons in my family um, and heard these scriptures all my life and grew up knowing them, did the Bible Bowl thing where I had to you know, learn them intellectually, memorize them, but then there had to come a point where I had to say that scripture is real and it's speaking to me and I couldn't allow it to be redundant or, or monotonous, uh, allow it to not affect me. Um, and so I had to begin to view scripture differently. If you're not careful, you can hear these same words repeated from the pulpit or as you read through your Bible and skim over them, allow them to not have an effect on you, allow them to not penetrate your heart. How's, how's that going in your life? Uh, there's a lot of things, other things that lead, you know, help us to understand that we're not in that light and that help us to understand that we're not walking as we should and we're not desiring the light like we should. Um, I think the ultimate result of a hardened heart or a calloused um, conscience is that the guilt of sin becomes less and less. Then we find ourselves knowing that we're doing wrong, as we know in Scripture is wrong within itself, to know to do right and do it not. We know that that's sin. But we also find ourselves doing the things that we know we ought not do, as Paul described that he oftentimes wanted to do something good, but found himself doing something bad. And he recognize this inner struggle but sometimes we even see that we're doing bad and go oh well or we even blame our humanity for that say I'm only human I can only do so much when scripture itself tells us that that not more will be placed on us than we can bear so how do we get back to that let's say that you are walking in that light provided by somebody else and you have veered off and you found yourself in darkness, how do you return to the light of God? How do you again have it shine in your life, allowing God's light to radiate through you? How do you get back to that point? Well, I think about people and, and that have found themselves in uh, hard positions and, and positions in which I believe they are outside the light. I think about David and his ordeal with Bathsheba um, as that's recorded for us in the Old Testament. As David found himself in a, a place where he really didn't need to be, first of all, he didn't even need to be home while his fellow brethren were at war. And not only did he not need to be there, but then he found himself on his balcony looking over uh, the city, scanning over the rooftops of the buildings around him. And, and as he locates the woman Bathsheba, there he, he thinks upon her and her beauty. And he had the opportunity right there, I, I think about it so often, that he could have turned around and walked back in his house. Could have even prayed for forgiveness had he lusted or, or anything like that. And, and this uh, episode would have never been recorded. But then not only did he look upon her, but then he inquired about her. And he said, who is she? And uh, his curiosity, curiosity got the best of him. And, and he asked who she was. And then upon finding out that she was the wife of Uriah, she was a married woman. He could have dropped it right there and said, okay, I shouldn't have even asked. 
And then not only that, did he inquire about her, but then he requested her to be in his presence. And he finds himself there alone with Bathsheba. We know the rest of the story that both Bathsheba, Bathsheba and David sinned that night. Bathsheba found herself with child and David was uh, presented with this information. And there, then again, he could have had the opportunity to say, this is terrible, I'm sorry, I need to come clean, I need to talk to Uriah, I need to pray for forgiveness, I need to take care of this. But again, he allowed sin to reign in his being, tried to trick Uriah into staying with his own wife, bringing him home from war, trying to trick Uriah into thinking that he is the father of Bathsheba's child. And when his plan ultimately failed, he found himself sending the orders to have Uriah murdered. That doesn't sound like a man who is striving to walk in the light at that moment. That night, it could have been just that night that he had a weak night. He had uh, uh, some weakness about him because we know the great qualities of David. We know that he was a man after God's own heart. But that night, he was not desiring to be in the light. He didn't want anything that he was doing to be exposed. Even to the point of he stepped deeper into the darkness to strive to trick Uriah and even deeper into the darkness as he ordered to have him killed. David finds himself in darkness. So what did he do? Well, I wonder what would have happened had God not ordered Nathan to pay David a visit. If Nathan had not come to David and told him the story of the little ewe lamb in 2 Samuel chapter 12. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, we know Nathan comes, tells a story of a man who had a ewe lamb, a one lamb that was so precious to him that was almost, that was as his own child. And that this ewe lamb meant everything to this man and he was poor and it was his only valuable possession. And then a rich man who had all the livestock in the world had a visitor one night. And instead of taking out of his abundance one of the lambs that he could have provided for his visitor, he took this man's only prized possession. Now, this infuriated David. You know, it, it says in verse 5 of 2 Samuel 12 that David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He was infuriated by this injustice that had been done. And it was Nathan who had to then translate this story to tell David, You are the man. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah, and all this has been too little. I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? God says, David, I gave you all the resources in the world. You are just like the man who had all the livestock, all the things he needed to feed his visitor, but still chose to take it from someone who it was the only thing they had. Nathan had to tell David, you are in a dark, dark place. You need to get yourself back in the light. You need to make this right. You need to do what it takes to, to remedy your relationship with God because you are in darkness. And so then we find David's response. We find it in Psalm chapter 51, a passage you're familiar with, and I know 
we're running out of time and I need to wrap this up. But we find ourselves sitting here looking at David in such a dark place. What did he have to do? We know that he spent time praying for the child to not be taken. We know he spent time in prayer and through Psalm 51 we know that he spent time trying to remedy his relationship with God through responding, having an emotional response about what he's done, through repenting, through being restored, and through talking to God about trying to become rejuvenated back into the light of God. Let's look at just a few, as we break down kind of Psalms 51 and think about this. I want you to think about this. If you could answer tonight and say that you are in a dark place, what do you need to do? Well, the first thing you need to realize is that it's a problem. You know, they say that's the first step to solving anything is realizing that you have the problem and, and, and coming up with a plan to fix it. Well, if you realize tonight that you're in darkness, you need to turn to God. It could be something you do privately, or it may be something you need to do publicly tonight with your brothers and sisters in Christ. But you need to talk to God about what it is that you've done and take responsibility for it. Listen to the words of Psalm 51, verses 1 through 6, as David is acknowledging that he is in darkness and that he is messed up. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin, my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. God had to say, it's me. I realize what I've done. Forgive me. I realize where I'm at. Forgive me. And he knew that through this repentance, and just like the repentance we spoke of earlier, found in 1 John, that if we're willing to repent of our sins and confess those sins that we have, that God is willing to forgive us of those sins. And he is willing to allow us to step back into the light of life that Jesus describes in John chapter 8 and the light that God is. We can step back into that light. Because in God is no darkness at all. So we can't bring our darkness back into our relationship with God. We have to say, I'm sorry, and let those things go and turn away from those things. But we know through what I've just said and through what, what is mentioned for us that we can be forgiven, that not only can we be forgiven, but here's a word that I don't think is used often enough. We can be restored, put back in a good condition, a saved condition, a condition in which we are walking in the light. Listen to what it says in verse 7 through 13 of Psalm 51. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. We have the ability to be restored, made back clean, made back whiter than snow. We have the ability to be Restored bones that were broken are going to be restored. Having a once again having a clean heart and having the joy of salvation. You can be restored tonight. 
by saying, I want to step back in to the light of life. You have that ability tonight. But then also, I want you to be ready. And for those of you who may not, may not be in a dark place tonight, but you're looking to where to go from here, well, it's that we need to be able to take our lives and use it to influence others. Verses 15, 16, and 17, David continues to write in Psalm 51, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. What is David saying here? He's saying, I'm giving you the true essence of who I am. A broken, sinful man. And I want to be in the light. And I want to tell others about the light. And I want to bring them into the light. And so tonight, you may find yourself not necessarily in a dark place, but you're looking for where to go. Well, here it is. Give your testimony. Tell about what God has done for you. Put God in your conversation. Give him your life and say, God, I'm yours. I want to be used. And if you do need to step out of that darkness tonight, you can turn on the light switch as soon as you're, uh, as soon as you're willing to repent and be forgiven. It's instant. You can be back in that light. Tomorrow, you can find yourself waking up and saying, I am now in the light. I want to let this light shine through me. I want to fulfill what scripture says to let me be the light of the world. I don't want to be hidden. I don't want to be in a position where no one can see me. I want them to see my good works, not for my glory, but for the glory of God. I always think about as Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, it said his face glowed, was glowing. His life was so full of the presence of God that he literally was glowing. We need to go out and glow. We need to go out and let our light shine. Tonight as I end this lesson for you, I want you to think about I'm going to read a scripture for you here in just a moment. But again, I want to say thank you for listening to my lesson this morning. Maybe it still is on the, the right track as far as what you were trying to accomplish with your summer series. It's not necessarily about understanding the light of life. I think your other speakers have done that and, and, and you know what it is. But the question comes is, do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to have it? Do you want to display it? Isaiah verse 60 or chapter 60 verses 1 and 2 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Are you in darkness tonight? Do you need to be in the light? Do you need to repent of the sins like David did? Do you need to come to truth that you are in a dark place now? Do you want to ask God to restore you back to that saved condition? And do you want to have the light of God shine upon you once again. If you need anything from this congregation, I know there are those here that will help you get you from where you are now to where you need to be. If you are willing, you can do that tonight. Thanks again. Let's pray before I go. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for being our God and offering us your light. We are not perfect, 
We are sinful people. But God, we want to strive daily to be as close to you as we can. Help us to stay in the light, to be the light, and to allow your light to shine through us. If there anybody here tonight that needs to have anything taken care of, pray that you will give them the courage and the strength to do that tonight. It's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thanks again for the invitation. I hope everyone has a wonderful night.